Our title tonight is The Lesson from the Garden of Eden. And we will begin our Wednesday night sermon. After creating the heavens and the earth in six days, God created on the last day the greatest creation of all, man. And he brought into the Garden of Eden and commanded man to rule over all creation, over all beasts and animals. Our scripture reading tells us four different meanings of the Garden of Eden in which God placed Adam. And first, it means joy. Second, gladness. Third, thanksgiving. And fourth, sound of melody or melody. These all mean Eden. And all these words refer, refer to human emotions and our state of mind. In other words, the Garden of Eden is an actual place where the first man, Adam, lived. And at the same time, this shows the state of the human heart at the time that man received God. And the moment a fallen person receives God, at that time, there will also be inside them joy, gladness, thanksgiving, and melodic praise in his heart. Genesis 2.15 tells us the following. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Here, the word man, translated from Hebrew, is ha-adam. And ha-adam, it means man. This was actually a noun, not an actual proper name given to man. So his name was not the proper noun, Adam, but just man. And in Genesis 3, 21, the Bible says, And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So after Adam fell, he was clothed by God. Here, the word Adam appears. And it is the same Hebrew word, Adam, which is referred to as a noun. However, in the Korean version and English Bible versions, the word Adam is used as a proper name or noun instead of its original Hebrew usage of a common noun. So since the fall of man, the name Adam was used. So Adam was not a name such as yours and mine, but it was used after man fell. However, we must know that the common noun Adam was used to describe the biblical figure that was created over 6,000 years ago. And this was in order to tell us that the story of Adam, which is man, 
is the story of each one of us here today. So this person, this man that existed 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden is not just a story of the past, but also our story as well. So since this is so, what are the lessons that we must learn from the Garden of Eden? Let us learn together. First, God placed the already, already created man in the Garden of Eden that he created thereafter. In other words, God placed man who was already created in the Garden of Eden that was created afterward. Genesis 2.8 And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. So we see here that man was created first, and then the Garden of Eden in which he was placed. This shows that a life that has previously lived without God, it can and will suddenly be filled with joy and gladness. So although we have lived without knowing God first, when God appears in our lives, we will be filled with joy like having a Garden of Eden in our hearts. When we receive God in our hearts, it becomes the Garden of Eden. Here, where it says planted, in Hebrew, it is nata. Planted means is nata in Hebrew. And what does it mean? It means to plant, specifically, to plant seeds. So why does the Bible use the word plant when it tells of the creation of the Garden of Eden? As the Bible says, God planted a garden toward the east. So why does this word plant, why is it used here? because this is telling us that just because we receive God does not mean that our hearts are complete just yet, but our hearts need to grow and be nurtured in order to be complete. So after you plant the seed, it doesn't mean that the fruit will exist right away but we have to plant it and watch it grow and nurture it. This is the same for us. As God plants the seed in us and we receive joy, gladness, thanksgiving, and melody in our hearts, fruit is not automatically produced, but it must grow in us. The word must grow in us and it must nurture us. Second Peter 3.18 says here, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So it says here, grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. So when we receive grace and our heart becomes the Garden of Eden, then we begin to grow. And Ephesians 4.13 tells us the similar message. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So here it says that we must also mature because we are all spiritual atoms. We should not be content thinking that just because we have received God, 
that our hearts have become a Garden of Eden. Why? Because at any moment the serpent can come inside and ruin all things that have been planted. So until we have grown to maturity, we will suffer Adam's fate. Secondly, what other lesson can we learn from the Garden of Eden? In the center of the Garden of Eden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the four rivers that originated from eating that flowed in all four directions. So all these things were inside Eden, which also shows what is also inside our hearts. Genesis 2, verses 9 through 10. And out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it divided and became four rivers. Here in the garden, it not only speaks of the tree of life, but it also speaks of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this is what caused trouble to the couple in the garden. So this tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil shows two different attributes of our hearts. We want to receive God fervently, and we praise God. But what happens as we do this? And within our hearts, there is also this tree of the knowledge of good and evil that tempts us and hurts us. So when we receive the word and receive grace, the attributes of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil lie, lies dormant. It does not cause trouble, but when we fall into problems, problems of our health, finances with people, as soon as this begins to grow, then this tree of the knowledge of good and evil suddenly springs up. And depending on our actions and words, we either bear fruit of good or evil. So also, in the Garden of Eden were four rivers. What does this signify? It signifies the mission of the word of eternal life that we receive from God. So we cannot just receive this grace and hold it for ourselves, but we must allow it to flow from the center of our hearts from our Garden of Eden. This is the message that comes from these four rivers. So like these rivers, we must not be still, but, the, but allow the word of God to flow in all directions of our lives. Here in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelations 22, one through two, the river is once again brought up. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Here the tree of life appears again. and it springs fruit. Why? Because the Garden of Eden has reappeared. It is reestablished, and this symbolizes the state of mind of the saints who will be restored in the last days. And third, what other lesson must we learn? God commanded Adam to rule over and keep the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2.15 
Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Here we see directly that God put him in the garden to cultivate it and keep it. Why? Because he was not yet at a mature level. And also because God knew that the serpent could enter at any time. That is why God told him to keep the garden. Here, the Garden of Eden in Hebrew is Gan Eden. The Hebrew word Gan means a fenced garden. It is not just a regular garden, but a fenced garden. So why did God call this garden a fenced garden? Why is it not just Eden, but gone Eden? It is because at any time, Satan could invade and trample on this garden. So it had to be protected. Just like our hearts. Man was to protect this garden. That is why it was a fence garden to be protected. And our hearts are just the same as this fence garden. As we live, we become anxious and worried and frustrated. But there are times that God enters our hearts and all the anxieties go away. But we shake again. But then God comes to our rescue and we flip like this all the time, going back and forth. So if we do not protect and fence our hearts in one moment, the serpent will enter and shake and ruin our faith and make us weak. So in the Bible, it says that while placing man in this fence garden, God commanded man to guard, keep, and rule over it. And this is found in Proverbs 4.23. Watch over your hearts with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. We must guard the heart of our Eden, which bears the tree of life. So within our hearts, we go from life to death. So we must protect our hearts. We must allow God to enter our hearts and nothing else so that we will not shake and fall. And Proverbs 16. 32 tells us, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. So it compares this to a war, a war that we must be truly considered with. And it's not the war that we see but the war that takes place in our hearts, those battles that erupt every day, if we don't control our hearts, then we can range with anger. And this war, this battle is more important to win, or else we will be deprived of the goodness that was once in our hearts. So if we cannot control our hearts, our hearts will be stolen. So we must be prepared for this battle that can happen any time in the Garden of Eden, our hearts, because Satan will never leave us alone. The thing Satan hates the most 
is when our hearts become this Garden of Eden in which we praise God, we are joyful to God, and we give thanksgiving to God. And this is the heart that the serpent truly wants to come in to ruin. That is why we must keep it, protect it with all our heart, with all our mind, or else our hearts will be stolen. And fourth, what lesson can we learn from the Garden of Eden? Fourth, God created a helper for Adam. God created a helper for Adam. God, within the Garden of Eden, did not like Adam being alone in the garden. So he created woman. Genesis 2.18 Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So we must understand God's heart at this time. He did not want to leave man alone in the garden by himself. Do you understand? So this means that God does not want us to alone be happy and joyful, but to share this with someone. So in Genesis 2, 22, what did God do? And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. So together, the man and woman were placed in the garden together. And this is what God was pleased with. So then what does the process of how woman was created teach us. She wasn't just created out of nothing, but she was taken from the man's rib and created. What does this process tell us? It tells us that we must have a co-worker of faith at our side in our hearts that are the gardens of Eden. So we must not only be a garden of Eden for ourselves, but we must share this, grow this with others. Then this garden of Eden can truly be protected and grow well. Ecclesiastes Four, verses 9 through 10. It compares what we should have in our Garden of Eden. Let's find it together. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 and 10. So, there are times when we alone, we want to be our own Garden of Eden. But we cannot do this because God knows that two are stronger than one. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10. Ready? Begin. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. So what is the trouble? when Satan enters your Garden of Eden. We must know there is no such thing as growing alone in faith. No matter how talented you may be, you always need someone to help you because there's not enough time and not enough labor. That is why we always need someone and God knows this because we were created to cooperate and help others. That's why God gave us a church and saints inside the church. So we can work together. One person alone cannot keep the Garden of Eden when we 
face difficult times. We need people to pray for us and to tell them we are going through difficulty so they can hold on to us, help us, so we cannot be alone like Adam once was, but like the woman that was created through his rib. We need a helper that will be with us so that we together can protect our Garden of Eden. So this woman specifically says in the Bible was fashioned from Adam's rib, not from his fingernail, not from his toe, but from his rib. So what is the Bible telling us? It is telling us that the woman who was created was a being of equal character and worth to Adam. And this is how we must view those who cooperate with us. We are all Adams, and we all need help, not specifically a woman, but from a co-worker of faith, because we all have equal value, no matter who we may think is outstanding or who is lacking. We must know that it does not matter who came first or who came last, but that we all share in the certain personalities, the same personalities, the same values, and we must believe that true cooperation and unity will take place. We have to stay and remain together. With things we cannot do, another person can. So we must look at each other equally. And when we work together like this, there is so much that we can produce. Please believe in this. Here, in this type of Garden of Eden, the serpent cannot enter and destroy it. Why? Because there are co-workers of faith standing together, guarding and protecting. And lastly, number five, what lesson can we learn from the Garden of Eden? Number five, Adam and his wife were naked, but not ashamed. So before fallen man, this was the image of the woman and the man. Genesis 2, 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So this means that everything could be seen because they had no clothing. But even though everything was seen, they were not ashamed. But how did this change after eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? This change is found in Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So why did they make themselves loin coverings? Because they wanted to hide their body parts because they were ashamed of themselves. There is something that allows us to know whether or not we are the Adam before the fall or the Adam after the fall. And that is, do we keep covering and hiding our hearts? Do we truly know ourselves and feel like ourselves? Or are we someone that we don't know? If we keep trying to hide who we are, then something is wrong. So this is our spiritual nakedness. When we are spiritually naked, are we ashamed? Or are we trying, are we trying to hide something? Or are we comfortable with ourselves? Do we know who we are? But when our inner and outer selves become the same, this shame disappears. So 
So when we know ourselves and we have nothing to hide, that we are not ashamed. And at that moment, you can walk through the Garden of Eden. Because you can walk through a world without hiding anything. The Bible calls being our true selves as living with simplicity. Why? Because there's nothing to hide. There's nothing to be ashamed of. So our true selves is living with simplicity. They are people who have recovered their Garden of Eden. Let us all find 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. So the incident that happened in the Garden of Eden, this verse shows what happened when the serpent deceived mankind. 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Let us all read with one voice. Ready, begin. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. So the, the moment we are tempted by the serpent, we can also lose our Garden of Eden in our hearts. Why? Because we lose our purity and our simplicity, our simple lives. So then, what is the way back to the Garden of Eden so we do not have to be ashamed, so we do not have to hide? What must we do? We must be truthful to ourselves. So with a true heart, we can follow and be in the light and love of Christ. So those who want to go back to the Garden of Eden, let us be truthful with ourselves. Ephesians 5, 9. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So if we do not want to be ashamed, then we must follow the light of Christ in goodness, righteousness, and truth. And 1 John 3.18 also tells us, Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. So in actions and truth, not with words, let us love one another. So this shows us that we can follow the light and love of Christ. How? By goodness, by being true. And this will sprout love in our lives with our deeds and actions. So at this time, may we have a heart that is restored to the Garden of Eden and be filled with joy and gladness, thanksgiving, and melodies. And at this time, may we be blessed with this type of simple, truthful, and pure life that makes our lives complete. I bless this upon you in the name of the Lord.